Welcome to Conversations on the Coast from San Francisco's Hotel Rex. Today is a very special day because we're being joined by J.K. Rowling, and she's going to be here for two whole shows, so we really appreciate your stopping by. Thank you very much. Uh, J.K. Rowling, Rowling has written three books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. They're called Arthur A. Levine Books, and they're published by Scholastic Press. So all that for purposes of identification. Publishers Weekly uh, called uh, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone a delightful romp. <laughs> and the Times Book Review said it was moving, impressive, and funny. Now, I like that because I think that's one of the, the better ways to get at what you're doing in these, in the, in, in these three books, to get at, at the fun of it. And uh, I, I think sometimes in reading these books, I, I, I felt you just wanted to have fun. Am I off the mark there? No, not very far off the mark. Um, I like the second of those reviews because it, because it describes what I'm trying to do. I, I am touching on themes that are moving, mm -hmm. but I do want to have a lot of fun while I'm doing it. These books are so much fun to write, I can't tell you. Well, they're an awful lot of fun to read, and, and I'd like to go through some of the things that I found fun. I don't Excellent. want to say funny because it's not really sometimes not funny, but it's just fun. Okay. There, there are characters in here. Rubius Hagrid. Yeah, I love Hagrid. Hagrid's one of my favorite characters. Now, Hagrid was. Hagrid, Hagrid's a, um, a wizard who was expelled from Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry at the age of 13 for something he didn't actually do, which people who have read the second Harry book will know. Yes, you got to get But he still one. kind of was doing stuff he probably would have been thrown out for anyway. So <laughs> we're not. And uh, he's not that, that academic minded he's um he's a giant well he's part giant in fact you you find out more of hagrid's heritage later in the in the series but um he's the kind of guy that's big enough to fill doorways that, that, he's enormous he's bigger often, bigger than door, most described. normal yeah. doorways yeah and he's uh the obsession of his life is uh strange and dangerous creatures the more dangerous the better the more he wants to take them home and look after them so and this it, is what leads him into a lot of trouble it, including a three-headed dog. A giant three-headed dog. Dragons. His, his real ambition is to own a dragon. Dragons, yeah. yeah. Dragons. Now, uh, what, my favorite character from the standpoint of, of how you named him mm -hmm. is <laughs> <laughs> Nearly Headless Nick. I love Nearly Headless who, Nick. Who's, who's a ghost. Yeah. He, uh, he was the victim of a botched beheading. They, uh, the, Botched. Yeah, yes, yes. the um, the axe wasn't sh wasn't sharp enough. So after <laughs> forty five blows with a That's blunt a bloody axe, mess, isn't it? it was a bloody mess. Poor man. After forty five blows, he was dead, but his head was still just hanging on by a bit of skin and sinew. Yes. So uh, he he has a he has a big inferiority complex about the fact that he's not properly well, beheaded. Well, I think he should have. I mean, there are certain <laughs> things that he can't do. He even got a letter telling him why he couldn't join the headless hunt. Yeah, That's he right. Could, he couldn't Poor be Nick. part of the headless hunt because he's uh -huh. he's not headless. Yeah. He's only nearly headless. Exactly. Yeah. Well, at, at, at any rate, uh, he's, he's nearly headless, and he invites his friends at the school to the Death Day Halloween party. I thought right. we should mention that since we're nearing Halloween as we sit here. Yep. Who, who's, uh, where actually totally headless horsemen <laughs> play a game of, of head, head hockey. hockey. <laughs> head hockey, yeah. Well, you would, wouldn't you? I mean, there's a limited amount of things you can do when you're dead to have any fun. And uh, if your head is detachable, I would have thought that playing some sort of sport with it was quite a good laugh. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I hesitate to, to bring up the next character whose, whose name I, I like a lot, uh, because I don't know where it's going to take us. Uh, Moaning Myrtle. Oh, Moaning Myrtle. Right, Moaning Myrtle is the ghost of a girl who haunts a bathroom. Now, I, I really like Moaning Myrtle. Moaning Myrtle. Well, let's go back. She's, uh, she haunts a bathroom. Well, she actually, a, a, a she actually, girl's bathroom. Yeah, yeah, she actually haunts a toilet, if I'm allowed uh, to say that word on air. Within the bathroom. Yeah, yes. she, uh, she basically sits in her cubicle and cries and sulks. And she had a very concrete inspiration. Girls of, I would say, pretty much eight and above will know that you can't enter a bathroom at a at a disco or a club without finding some girl crying her eyes out in there about uh, how badly her boyfriend is treating her or how he's just dumped her. And that was kind of the inspiration for Moaning Myrtle. She has the wailing of sisters Yeah, there. loads of sisters. I've been one of her sisters at times. Okay. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of a literary figure in, in the book uh, of, of a sort, uh, Gilderoy Lockhart. Yeah, of a sort, uh, would of be a correct. Sort. Now, he, he seems to me to be what uh, one might call a stuck-up author. 
Well, he he um. I have to be very careful what I say here. Gilderoy was... Insp- being an author yourself, yes. Well, it's not really uh, being offensive to authors, though I'm, though I'm sure that his uh, real counterpart is out there somewhere. But he, Gilderoy was inspired by someone I, d- I did actually know, but, it, but this person wasn't an author, but was equally self-aggrandizing and, and equally egotistical. Yeah, and, and he, it turns out, in, in, in the, I guess it's the, it's the second book, where he... You know, is bragging about everything he can do. Right. And when push comes to shove, he just he's well. There's he nothing there. He's yeah. all um, image and no substance. Paul Gilderoy. Yeah. The most popular game at this very different school is Quidditch. Yeah, Quidditch. I and love Quidditch. When, when we come back, we're going to find out what Quidditch is okay. and how you play it. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. Welcome back to Conversations on the Coast. We're talking today to J.K. Rowling, who is the author of uh, three books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and the latest book, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. In uh, writing about uh, the uh, Harry Potter and the uh, Chamber of, of Secrets, a very important uh, medium, particularly for children's books mm-hmm. uh, in our country, book list, uh, gave it a starred review and said this, Harry Potter's exploits during his second year at uh, Hogwarts School for Witchcraft and Wizardry completely live up to the bewitching measure of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. The mystery, zany humor, student rivalry, and eccentric faculty are as expertly crafted here as in the first book. And that's a very important review because sequels are so often bad news. In, I, in, I in know what you're saying, but for me, these aren't sequels. You see, I always plan this as a seven-book series, and I see this as one huge work. I mean, it, it's going to be sizable by the time I finish book seven. I, so, I remember in uh, one, of the, one of your television interviews that I saw your, mm-hmm. your schema for that. Yeah, so right. It, it really has been it, it, from it, the very before, beginning. Before um, Sorcer- Sorcerer's Stone was finished, I had all seven books plotted. Mm-hmm. Five is the shakiest plot. I can, yeah, I can exclusively reveal. Um, <laughs> it will not. It's not the shakiest plot. Uh, it's the one that has been least uh, has been least meticulously plotted so okay. far for some for some bizarre okay. reason. But um, yeah, so I don't really see them as sequels because I always knew what was going to happen next. It, uh, and I conceived of it as one long, long story. Yeah, it's, 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 yeah, it's whole, just being whole cloth that, cut into yeah. chunks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, in each of the books, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that have been uh, put out so far, you spend a good deal of time on a game called Quidditch. Quidditch, yeah. Now, tell us about Quidditch. Okay, so Quidditch is a, is a sport, the most popular sport in the wizarding world. Seven players aside... Um, six goal posts, three at either end, um, played on broomsticks, four balls. Now, wait a minute, not just broomsticks. No. Well, there are flying different... Flying broomsticks. Naturally, uh, flying broomsticks, yeah. and you have different makes of broomstick, as you would. Yes. Um, Harry Potter himself owns... Well, if you've read Prisoner of Azkaban, you'll know he owns the best, the Ferrari, in fact, of the broomstick world, which is a fireball. Oh, well, congratulations, Harry. Yeah. He, he was behind he in got the second lucky. book in, in terms of In the second book, was, that's yeah. right. He, um, he had, he'd been pipped at the post by his arch enemy, who had now got a Nimbus 2001, whereas Harry was still riding last year's model, the Nimbus 2000. Ah. Yes. Praise the Lord. Absolutely. Yes. Now, uh, is there any particular reason for your spending so much time on, on, on this game? I have my own thoughts about this. Um, is there any particular reason? There are numerous reasons. It's, it, Quidditch advances the plot in several places. Yes, it does, absolutely. It's yeah. a device for furthering the plot. Yeah. It's also, I, uh, early on, very early on, when I was still writing Sorcerer's Stone, I was still kind of fleshing out the details of this whole world. It became clear to me that a, a unifying factor in any society, and perhaps particularly a hidden one, would be a sport somewhere where they could congregate and be themselves, and therefore I invented Quidditch. It was just, it's a matter of, kind of it's logic, really. Any, any society has certain hallmarks, certain bonding factors, and it seemed to me that sport is an important one. You know, it, it reminds me of... Uh my son's experience at the University of Notre Dame uh-huh. uh, here in 
the United States and South Bend, Indiana, in, in which uh, they're very famous for their football teams. Right. But if you go there as, as a student, mm -hmm. you are almost obliged to take part in various sports. They oh, have a lot of touch football. My worst nightmare. And, and, they, and they have a basketball. <laughs> my basketball worst nightmare. If so, it, being forced to do any kind yeah. of sporting but activity. But they, they see it as that, as a way of letting off steam and, and, and bonding. I can see that. Uh, I can see the benefits of sport as yeah. long as, as no one's I mean, forcing they're not, they're me to participate. By, by law, it's by, you know, <laughs> no, I know. Peer, it's, peer it, pressure, absolutely. Which, which is part of this too. Sure, I mean, but Harry, Harry doesn't particularly want to play Quidditch well, initially. He, well, he he turns out to be very gifted at it, but no one's press ganged into playing the sport. That to me would be a horrific nightmare because I'm a very unsporty person myself, he, and this he, is this in a way is wish fulfillment. I would love to be good at something physical, but I'm appalling at it. You, you once said uh, in an interview that the basic idea for Harry Potter was for a boy who didn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this is something that came to you when you were riding a train That's back right. in uh, 1990. 1990, yeah. And I, I think what goes on in these books really fulfills that. I hope so. I, th I feel that I've actually stayed very true to that four-hour train journey when I when I came up with a lot of the ideas. I, at that point, I didn't know the full, the, the larger plot that moves through all seven books, but certainly loads of the details of the, the wizarding world that, that are in these books were created on that train journey. Yeah. And, 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 and part of that not knowing who he is is, is caused right. by where we find him in that Absolutely. Well, I, can, I had to kind of work backwards and forwards. I saw him as a boy who... Yeah, he just didn't know what he was and who he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore I had to create his history, which I did largely do on that train journey, and his future, of course. J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter books are much too artful to be preachy, but there, but there are, I think, moral messages to be gleaned from them. We'll talk about that possibility when we return. Great. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. Welcome back to the final segment of Conversations on the Coast, first part of a two-part interview with J.K. Rowling, creator of Harry Potter, and three wonderful books. Uh, before we get to the possibility of, of uh, moral messages, uh, I have to talk about a bit of wizardry that uh, Harry performs at the beginning of book three mm -hmm. involving his Aunt, Aunt Marge. Marge. <laughs> uh, one of my favorite pieces of wizardry. What happened there? Well, Aunt Marge is a, is a horrible, horrible person. And um, she gets her just desserts when she's criticising Harry's parents, his, his dead parents. They died when he was one year old. Um, and she never knew them. She's made gross assumptions about them. And in defence of his parents' memory, he, um, he, he basically he blows her up in the sense of inflating her. She's full of hot air and he makes her full of more hot air. And, and, and we, we leave her... <laughs> we leave her bobbing up on the ceiling, unable to speak, because she's been stretched so oh, tightly. the poor dear. Well, not re well. <clears throat> not that I condone that sort of thing, but uh, she really is a horrible person. And th th it's, it's interesting that uh, there are really two kinds of people involved with, with Harry in, in these books. W one group, uh, very, very intent on doing horrible things to him. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, and, and, and with... In a, in a kind of relentless way, mm -hmm. and then there are those who walk around and see the mark on his on his scar or the mark on his, on his forehead, right? And and see him as a a wizard of a very high order. Mm -hmm. there, there doesn't seem to be any in between there for the poor. Well, boy. the only place there is an in between for Harry, and this is an important part of the books, is in the friends he makes himself with his peers. He has a very it is very disorientating for him in that in one world, in the muggle world, as in the non-magic world, he is nothing. Mm -hmm. And he, he is really despised by his muggle relatives as someone abnormal. They, they, they are afraid of and they, and they look down upon his magic. Then in the magical world, you're absolutely right. The vast majority of people see him because he, ha he, he managed to su survive something no one else ever survived, Lord Voldemort's c curse. They see him as this extraordinary person who is not treated normally by them either. His refuge is with his friends who value him for himself. Mm -hmm. the, uh, 
uh, books really, if they if you look at them at a certain level, are about plot. Yeah. I mean, there, I mean, <laughs> things are happening mm-hmm. one after the other, which I, I think is one of the reasons they probably appeal to uh, younger readers because. Well, I I I like to think I hope that they are character driven books. To me, the starting point with these stories was character every mm-hmm. time. However, I do put an enormous amount of work into my plots. I try very, very, very hard to keep the pace tight. Um, th- and I'm, I'm simply trying to do what I like to read. I love to read a well-crafted and a well-plotted book. A, a lot of people find that quite a deadly virtue. I find it an enormous plus in a novel. I like to feel that, I, I, you know, a seamless piece of writing, you keep wanting to turn the pages. That's what I'm always aspiring to. Whether mm-hmm. I get there or not is not for me to say. And certainly there are people who do it better. But I, that's what I'm always aiming to do. But the magic, if you will, excuse the expression, is that the plot turns continually reveal character. Well, I hope that's, so. That's, that's what I think the, really happens most of the time. That's, that's what I hope. That's quite an achievement. Thank you. That's quite an achievement. One, one of the places where, where, where you pause and, and perhaps put out a message yep. is uh, at the, the very end of... Uh, Sorcerer's uh, Stone. The, the Sorcerer's Stone. Mm-hmm. Uh, the I, I think it's the uh, director of the school is, is Albus talking. Dumbledore. Yep. Your mother died. He says to to save you. Mm-hmm. If there is one thing Voldemort cannot understand, it, it is, is love. love. He didn't realize that love, as powerful as your mother's for you, leaves its own mark, not a scar, mm-hmm. no visible sign. To have been loved so deeply, even though the person who loved us is gone, will give us some protection forever. It is in your very skin. Yep, something I believe. That is it's very, very important. Yeah, and I think for very for children, just to know that you have been loved genuinely does give you protection forever. It sounds very corny, perhaps, but it's probably the most important thing you can do for a child is to make sure they know they are loved and therefore lovable. That's very important in their future future relationships. That they are lovable, mm-hmm. because so many times they well, somehow get to the conclusion that they're. They are not lovable, not. and therefore they start disliking themselves and everyone else in the process. Yeah. Another point where you, uh, again, it's uh, Dumbledore speaking, and this is in the Chamber of Secrets toward the end. Mm-hmm. And exactly, said Dumbledore, beaming once more, which makes you very different from Tom Riddle. It is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. That, again, is something I deeply yeah. believe. And, I mean, that is a, a message for, for children, a message for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, we are more more than whatever kind of abilities we, we have because our those, those things are always being Absolutely. looked at one way or the Your other. Your talents, way, but, whatever they may be, are, are not something you worked to get. You, you're allowed, however, to pride yourself on the things you choose to do. We're going to return next week and talk some more with uh, J.K. Rowling. And I think when we come back, I'd like to talk about a little bit more about the third book in the series than we have so far, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, and about what the media, at least in this country, are calling the Harry Potter phenomenon. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Welcome to Conversations on the Coast from San Francisco's Hotel Rex Crossroads for the Creative. Today we have the second part of our two part interview with J.K. Rowling. J.K. Rowling is the author of the three most popular books in America today, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. They're all written by J.K. Rowling. They are Arthur A. Levine books, and they are published by Scholastic Press. Thank you for coming back. Really appreciate it. Thank you. I'd love to spend some some time on the on the on the newest book the, this 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 time out, and uh, let's begin with something that uh, USA Today reviewer uh, said: uh, "It's three for three for British author J.K. Rowling. That's a big baseball term. <laughs> Thank uh, you for that. Who scores another home run? Yeah, I got home run. You got that one <laughs> with Harry Potter and the Prisoner of 
of Azkaban, the third in her projected series of seven books about Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. So that's one of the early reviews. I don't know how it's going after that because I haven't I haven't seen anything else. Mm-hmm. But uh, it sounds like it's off and running. Seems to be okay. Now we we did talk a little bit the last time about Aunt Marge and Aunt Marge and the ballooning thing. Yeah, poor Aunt Marge. And uh, as always, though, in in book three, Harry is more than anxious to get back to school. Very, very anxious to yeah, get back I mean, to school. Because of people like Aunt Marge. Exactly. Whom he had to balloon because she's such a nasty. And uh, this time he goes back by a different means, a rather strange bus. Yeah, a different means of transport. Um, Harry, so Harry runs away from his aunt and uncle's house, which actually um, children have been asking me for ages, why doesn't he just run away? Um and I wanted to say, well, he will do next time. You, you wait and see. But I couldn't because it would give everything away. Um, so he does run away. He falls over in the street. He doesn't intend to summon this particular bus, but he does by flinging out his wand hand to break his fall. And bang, there appears a triple-decker purple bus, the night bus with a K, that um, exists to pick up stranded witches and wizards. What a neat bus. Yeah, I like to think so. I mean, it the, has very comfortable seating, as I recall. Yeah, well, in fact, at night time, it's full of, full of beds. Ah, right. But they change that to armchairs in the daytime. That's, that's very that's very nice. Now, the, this bus has an interesting power that, that <laughs> no bus or car that I know of. Now, <laughs> the, the, the driver of this bus it doesn't really matter doesn't a heck really. of a lot if he or she is watching. No, the driver because is <laughs> because buildings jump out of its way. Anything, anything in its way will move backwards for it. Buildings and trees. And Which kind of shows you what kind of a driver I am. <laughs> to wish that any vehicle would do that. An autobiographical note has been discovered. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the most important things going on in all three books, I think, is uh, the notion of friendship. Right. Now, we, we uh, touched on that a little bit in the uh, first part of our talk. Uh, but it, it is a very, very important continuing theme. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, let's talk about some of those friendships Harry has. Harry is a is a friend of Hagrid. Yes. And Hagrid seems to me to be a strange guy for him to befriend. Well, Hagrid... I mean, he's not a terribly appealing... I mean... <laughs> you don't find Hagrid appealing, Well, no, not, not in the ordinary sense. Hagrid's very appealing. Um, I think the thing is that Hagrid is, um, for all his... Uh, Weaknesses, and he does have several dragons and drink mainly. Uh, Hagrid <laughs> is very protective. He's a very protective person. He has a good heart, and he was also the first magical person with whom Harry has any memory of contact. So Hagrid was That's a very right. Hagrid's important person. That's right. Hagrid's the one who took him person, shopping for right. the first time. Yeah. And also, Hagrid is not very a very accomplished wizard, and Hagrid is someone in whom Harry can confide worries. Mm. because Hagrid is not, for example, like the headmaster of the school, who is a genius and, and a little bit more intimidating, approachable, um, really. Harry has to find out, though, how approachable Dumbledore is. In the meantime, he, is, he still seems quite a, a distant I character. just thought of something else that I think is admirable about Hagrid. And I'm not, I'm not exactly sure of the instance, but at one point in, in the story, mm-hmm. Hagrid comes forward and confesses that he did something wrong, that, yes. he, that he made a mistake. No, he has a very, very good heart. He's, he has weaknesses. Mm-hmm. Um, I have been told he's morally ambiguous, but to me he's, he's a good person with, an, with, but with weaknesses. And yes, he's, he's honest and he's very, very brave, and I value bravery, and, and um, Harry also values bravery. In, in, in a way, Harry has a friendship with the headmaster of the school, Albus Dumbledore. Mm-hmm. Now that's yes. a very that's that's kind of surprising in, in a way because Dumbledore is hardly comes on the scene, but he's he's calling Harry and they kind of become friends, don't they? Well, there's a lot I could tell you about Harry and Dumbledore's relationship, but I'm not going to because it's kind of key to subsequent plots. So I have to keep that one a bit more quiet. <laughs> oh, okay, that that's fine, that's fine. Harry Potter has made uh, J.R. Rowling a household name in England and America. And they're beginning to know her in, they tell me, 28 other countries. <laughs> what that uh, experience is like when we come back. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. 
follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com. Welcome back to Conversations on the Coast from San Francisco's Hotel Rex. We are continuing the second part of our chat with J.K. Rowling, the author of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, and Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. According to Time Magazine, uh, you are at the center of one of the most bizarre <laughs> and surreal stories in the history of publishing. Bizarre, surreal. <laughs> Is that accurate in any way from where um, you sit? Very accurate from where I, I sit. No one, no one, I promise you, is more surprised by this than I am. I was so my my focus was always just try and get the book published, and I never looked much beyond that, and I never dreamt that what what has happened would happen. Never, mm. at all. I I didn't I I had no sense that I was writing a, a particularly commercial book or a commercial book at all. I just you you were just, just writing loved, what you had to write it, precisely. I was yeah. writing for me. And uh, what I really wanted to write, yeah. You know, Time uh, makes a suggestion in the same article uh, that the secret of your success lies in what you know. Rowling, they say, knows how to feed the desire not just to hear or read a story, but to live it as well. She has, quote, an uncanny ability to nourish the human hunger for enrichment. And, you know, that may answer the, the question that was on my mind that I've heard from other authors, actually, other children's authors, mm -hmm. is why in the heck do your book appeal, these books appeal to adults? Uh, yeah. It's a very jealous remark, incidentally, I think, from other <laughs> children's authors. But, I mean, it's, it's, it's being made. Yeah. It's being made. Um, see, I mean, if I asked you, did you have an audience in mind, you'd say no. You'd say just I would absolutely say no, yeah. yeah. But then I, I started writing about Harry when I was 25. I finished the first book when I was 30. Mm. Um, I'm an adult, and the humour in the book certainly is my sense of humour. It's not what I think kids think mm -hmm. is funny, um, which I think is part of the way, or part of the explanation. As for the rest of the explanation, it's as much of a mystery to me as it is to anyone else, really. And frankly, I don't try and analyse it. I really don't, Just because I think if I, if I do decide oh, that's the formula, then it might well be that in books five, six, and seven, I'm trying to put a little bit too much of ingredient X in there, and that's not what I want to do. I want to carry on writing them exactly as I want to write them without trying to pander to anyone else's um, sensibilities. Yeah, if you start paying attention to your yeah, notices, so you, to speak, you're going to trip over You're, you're going to write to the notices. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I just want to you know, throw one more at you because I like it. The okay. same article, Time, says something that I, I believe in. That there's uh, people out there mm -hmm. want to believe the unbelievable, and rolling makes it easy and great, good, fun for them to do so. That's that's a nice. There, that's there a is nice a need quote. for that. There really is. There really is because yeah. you know what is all around us is very often so disheartening uh -huh. and so and so depressing that you know, for goodness sakes, give me something else. I can see that. I feel that as a reader, so uh -huh. I understand that. There's another thing that, that's, that's going on in, in, in the books, in my opinion, that there is a, a – a, I don't know how else to say this. I don't think you'll like this uh, – <laughs> that there's a, a kind of a, a teaching aspect going on. And this is what I mean uh, by it. Go on then. That, 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 that you are asking people, mm. readers, if you will, young and old, to look beneath the surface of things, mm -hmm. to uh, understand that good – may be found in surprising places? Um, yes. I never sit down to write a book without... Um, I never sit down to write a book and, and think, what's the moral point we're going to make this time? Thank God you don't. Ever. You know, then, then it would become pedantic. It, it would become preachy and annoying, and I never enjoyed being preached at when I was a child, and I don't enjoy it now. However, morals do evolve naturally out of the tales you're telling. And sometimes it's impossible to tell which came first. Yeah. There is a plea for tolerance throughout these books, perhaps most obviously in Chamber of Secrets, where there is a lot of prejudice rampant in the school. Um, it's a really very mild message, but I think just a few centimetres more tolerance in the world would make it so much nicer to live in. So um, that that happens throughout the books. Again, I can't say too much about what you'll find out, but they... <laughs> yeah. But you'll the, see the that whole business of, of uh, 
a good coming forth in strange places, mm -hmm. I, I think is, and I don't, and, and you shouldn't get into this too too deeply because it gives away plot. But it's uh, it comes across to me, at least in the way uh, Voldemort comes in and out of the books. Yeah, you know, um, I mean, you think, I think you have him. <laughs> the yeah. reader think oh, yeah. this is the guy. This uh -huh. is the evil guy. Mm -hmm. And then uh, something happens, mm -hmm. and it's not the evil guy. Yeah. I, yeah, I work quite hard at that. I also like to examine how people got to be the, the way they are, and that includes Lord Voldemort. I never wanted to create a pantomime villain, you know, I, I mean a cardboard cutout here. I wanted him to be a, a believable person who has followed a certain route. I mean, again, it's choice. He is someone who chose sure. to do the things... He, he does. We're not talking someone who, bang, was created evil. He's, he's followed a path this way, and he hasn't cared too much about the choices he's made and who got hurt. And um, we've, we've spent a good deal of time talking about what critics and others are saying about J.K. Rowling. When we come back, we're going to give J.K. Rowling a chance to have her say. <laughs> You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at JimFosterCoc and email JimFosterCoc at gmail.com. We're back with Conversations on the Coast from San Francisco's Hotel Rex, and this is the, uh, the last part of our two-part program, our visit uh, with J.K. Rowling, the author of the Harry Potter books, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. We are very, very grateful for your taking so much time with us. Thank you. And and uh, I think I want to begin the, the, the last segment uh, with talking about uh, some of the criticism that's been out there about the Potter books. Uh, for being too violent. That's what's been in our newspapers here mm -hmm. in, in San Francisco. And before you answer, I want to share with you what a local 11-year-old girl wrote to the San Francisco Chronicle. I, don't, right. I didn't cut out the piece. I'm going to paraphrase. Okay. There was an article in the paper about, I don't know, not, on, not in this area, but some, someplace else in the country, they were either banning or thinking of banning your books because there was too much violence in them. Right. Okay. And there's a news story. And then two days later in the... Uh, on the op-ed page yeah. was a letter from an 11-year-old girl and who said in the letter that your books are being read in her class, right. that everyone likes the books, mm -hmm. no one in the class finds them violent, and she pointed out in her letter that the wizards don't use guns. I think that's they a valid point, They don't have to use guns. <laughs> yes, they've got well, all other kinds of things. We haven't, in my books, one time, three books so far, seen anyone killed. Right. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen, but I think it's more than plain whose side I'm on. Yes. And that is a fairly crucial point. If you turn on any video game that I've seen, even for quite small children, you will find ten times the violence there are in my books. There is in my books. So uh, I, I find it laughable, really. I do, find, I do find the idea that there's too much violence in the books laughable. I, I think it's important that the 11-year-old found, found it laughable. I, I, mean, this, I think it's incredibly important, but I have said all along that the children, I've now met thousands of children here, and I would say that every single one of them has been a lot smarter about the books and seems to get the point of them a lot better yeah. than a than a yeah. outraged minority. So. Yeah, she, she wound up her, her letter making the statement that read... Swiss Family Robinson, she said. Thank we you. had to in class, and <laughs> that's what's violent. Well, it is, but yeah. that doesn't mean you shouldn't read that either. True. That's a True. great book. So, uh... One of the mm, wonderful design aspects of all three books are the jackets and the internal art. These are my favorite editions. I've now seen nearly 30 different editions of the Harry Potter books. And, and these, the, these um, are illustrated by a woman by Mary the, Grand Prix. Mary, Mary Grand Prix, and she's just done the most fabulous job. And as I say, I've seen, I've seen Finnish and Greek and Dutch, and I, I can't tell you how many different editions I've seen now. And twenty-eight the, languages. It's twenty-eight ang languages and more to come. And these are my favourite editions. Yeah, I think they're stunning. Yeah, you know, you know what's what I liked about it is that when when you read the stuff, you start to get 
visual images. Absolutely. Of course, you know, what, who does this one look like and what does that place look like? Sure. And then you go back, at least I did, to, to the chapter headings. Right. And, Wow, that's good. Yeah, it's really, I kind of see it What's the same very, thing. very skillful about how Mary has illustrated these books, and, and one of the reasons I like them so much, she, she knows how to give a hint of what's there without giving too much away. Right, she does that right. perfectly every time. Yeah, and they're, I actually they're very think, tight. Absolutely. They're very tight. And I think that kind of echoes well with, with the sort of tone of my books. You know, I, I think it, with, the, with the writing. I mean, mm-hmm. they're very much in keeping with the writing of the book. So did, you, did you work closely with her? I mean, No, and this is, this is the amazing thing. She, um, my editor, Arthur A. a. Levine, he, um, he was very interested in having her do work on the books, and he made a great choice. And did you just recently meet her? Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, four or five days ago in Chicago for the huh. first time. She's a very nice woman. I was so glad I liked her. <laughs> uh, Always when I love someone's work, I really want to like them personally, and I did. I liked her a lot. She's a very nice woman. And she also did the Time magazine. She cover. did, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was something. There aren't many books like yours that get a cover in Time magazine. <laughs> I, I know it that. is bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> and surreal. Yeah. It really is bizarre. We're... We're talking toward the end of October here, and we're talking toward the end of your United States tour. Actually, yep. your second tour. Yes. Uh, and uh, how, how do you think it's gone? Um, I think it's gone really well. But you should probably ask all the poor people who had to stand in queues for a signature. Um, but I've really enjoyed it, if that's anything to go by. <laughs> One thing that I that I saw in, in observing uh, what went on at the uh, at the signing today that that wasn't uh, that something that didn't happen. Uh-huh. The first time around, you were able to talk to maybe 30, 40 uh, Children, young, young yeah. readers and get into a real dialogue with uh-huh. them afterwards. That's missing, isn't it? It's a, it's weight of numbers. Yeah. It, you, it, it becomes humanly impossible to do that mm-hmm. when you have over a 1,000 people lined up to get their books signed. And that's... I, I hope... I mean, I try and speak to everyone. I genuinely try and speak when to everyone. When you sign, yeah. yeah definitely, yeah. because that's a really important thing. But obviously, yeah, you can't have to sit and have a long conversation with each and every person anymore. Well, in the bizarre publishing business, we call it a trade-off. Oh, is that right? <laughs> We're very grateful for the impact that, that you've had, particularly on young readers who are picking up your books and others while computer games are being abandoned, at least for a while. And these young readers are talking and they're discussing and they're memorizing some really fine writing. J.K. Rowling, you have given us a great gift. Thank you for that. And thank you for being so generous with your time and Conversations on the Coast. Thank you very much indeed. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email jimfostercoc at gmail.com.